it's a pleasure to be here with you. And uh, this is a little impromptu uh, that they asked us to share. So uh, bear with us if we our thoughts are not fully uh, formed, but kind of in process. Um, I'd like to talk about something that I'm not very good at, but I realize is very important. Um, how many of you are here this morning? Can you raise your hand if you're present? Okay, good. That's a good start. Being present, being in the moment, um, that's not something I'm good at. Naturally, I'm oriented towards the future and the past. I'm either thinking about something, wondering why it went the way it did, and trying to understand it, or I'm thinking about something out ahead that's a goal to be reached. But being present in the moment is where God wants us and where the Holy Spirit can use us. Um, he doesn't work in the future, and He doesn't work in the past. He works in the present. Today is the day of salvation, right? So, with our families as men, um, with our wives, Future affection is not very well perceived. Past affection is not remembered. <laughs> um, it's what's present. And if we come from a, a, an industrial society or a performance-oriented culture, it's that much the harder. The task, the schedule, um, our overseers, our leaders, our support team, um, let's get it done, right? That's, that's kind of our orientation. We tend to have that as men. So I'd like to think about this a little bit. Um, I'm going to use a couple of scriptures here, probably out of context, but for the sake of what we're talking about, I think it will work. Um, in Luke 11, I think we can, any of us who have been on the field, or thinking about going to the field should be able to relate to this idea. Um, Luke 11, uh, Jesus gives this idea of a, of a neighbor, and uh, verse 7, well, maybe before that, verse 5. He also said to them, suppose one of you has a friend and goes to him at midnight and says to him, friend, lend me three loaves of bread because a friend of mine on a journey has come to me and I don't have anything to offer him. Then he'll answer from inside and say, don't bother me. The door is already locked and my children and I have gone to bed. I can't get up to give you anything. How many times have you faced a situation like this where there's this tension? Your family, your immediate situation, maybe the context of the moment, tired, the time of day, etc., and the importunity of the request. What do you do with that situation? Um, let's contrast it with Luke 14. So in, um, in Luke 14, we have another idea. Verse 26, very familiar. Sorry, I need reading glasses, so Let's see here I can get it to the right place. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. But then you have Luke 18, and you have Jesus in the middle of everything, probably his disciples keeping a close eye on the schedule. And you have him saying, Jesus, however, invited them, let the little children come to me and don't stop them because the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. There's a continual tension in life between all these different things. And that's how God made us. And that's how he made everything. I mean, think about it from a scientific perspective. Those of you who have more of that mind, um, I'm not in that category, but I am aware of some things. Um, everything functions in tension, in relationship. Um, 
poles, magnetism, atoms, um, protons and neutrons. Everything in matter has to do with tension. It's how the world was designed. It's how our creator built everything. It's how he set up relationships. It's how he set up his laws or instructions. There's always a higher one and a lower one. There's always one that cannot be broken in fulfilling the other one. It's how Jesus could say, love God, love your fellow man, and then all the others will be fulfilled. There's a hierarchy. And there's a tension between them. How do I deal with this situation? Um, that passage in Luke 18 goes on to say, It goes on to say that a ruler asked him, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He says, why do you call me good? Jesus asked him, no one is good except God alone. You know the commandments, do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not bear false witness, honor your father and mother. He says, I have kept all these from my youth. When Jesus heard this, he told him, you still lack one thing, sell all you have and distribute it to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. After he heard this, he became extremely sad because he was very rich. So we can engage our mind and our will to be law abiders and task focused and fulfill duties. But we need something else to love. We need something else. We need the Holy Spirit's movement in the moment to tell us what to do when. We need something else to discern how to fulfill the ultimate as we fulfill the lesser and when to fulfill this one and when to break that one in order to fulfill the ultimate. And that's the tension that we have to live in if we're going to live according to God's heart and his purpose. And in the moment, we often don't even know if we're doing it right. And we have to accept that. We have to be able to be led by the Spirit. Uh, think about Jesus with Nicodemus. And what does he say? The wind blows and you don't see it, but you see what it does, right? You see the leaves move. And that's, that's the kind of life of love and of walking, hearing his voice that we're called to. And it's the only one that will accomplish his heart where we're sent. Um, I don't know where I am on time, but I wanted to just share two, um, two things. Um, recently had a really interesting experience with the Tawaka community in Honduras. I had been there in 2002 for just a few days. Um, after a month plus of a couple of companions from Costa Rica and myself taking Bibles and books around down the Coco River, up across the lagoons, up the Patuca River, we'd been yeah, maybe almost two months journey by dugout and raft and on foot. And um, so this is the end of that. This was our last task. And sometimes your last task, you're just kind of thinking about getting home. Um, you've been sick a lot. You're tired all the time. Uh, it's been a long time since you... Um, spoke to your family that in those days there were no cell phones there was only communication radios in some communities and so I think I made one call home in that period from a bigger city and um, but this was our last stop and after that it was just try to get out another week and a half on the river till we could find our way out and um, the, it was a Catholic community at the time. There were no other churches except for one small Moravian church. And the Catholic leader put us up in his home. And um, I spoke some Mayang at the time. I wasn't real fluent in it yet. And uh, he helped me organize a, um, a, tr a group of young men to bring Bibles back from Nicaragua, about a six-hour walk. So we walked out to Nicaragua through a gap in the mountains, and then they carried them back. I never knew what the fruit was of that contact because I never made it back. 
So there was quite a sense of anticipation, somewhat fear, somewhat anxiety as I entered this community 22 years later. Am I going to meet these same people again? What was their impression? Did I offend them? I have no clue. I have had zero contact for 22 years. And as I walked down through and everything's changed now, the forest that was just like the Garden of Eden behind the village is all cow pasture. The drug lords have taken over. Um, there's a road now. As I walk into the village and I'm walking through, I'm trying to recognize something because everything's changed so much. I recognize the Catholic Church on the hill. That was there in 2002, just built. Um, I kind of oriented myself with where I remembered his house was. And as we walked there and I asked a question or two, sure enough, I found the house and showed up and um, said hi and normal greetings. And then we started to visit and he started to tell me, he said one time, a long time ago, over a long time ago, I'm not sure exactly when, um, someone came sort of like you came from the river and um, visited with us and he spoke some of our language and then um, he brought, organized to bring some Bibles back. He said, that was me. And he teared up and gave me a big hug. And it was quite a reunion. He's been sick a bit. He's quite a bit older now. And, um, but his wife was there. His wife recognized me right away when I walked up, but she didn't say anything to him. Anyway, um, it's like being with a long lost <laughs> relative or friend. And yet we'd only had two or three days together. So I don't know what the Lord did there. I don't know how he worked through us in our worn out shape the time we were there, but he provided a door for us to come back. And um, he's probably the most influential man in the village and still Catholic and still the leader, but he has a lot of spiritual discernment and he has a lot of knowledge of the Bible. And so we had some very deep conversations, good conversations prayed together, and uh, spent a bit of time with them. They gave us a house to live in, just took us in as if we were family while we were there. Um, so you don't know, you have no clue. Every moment, every day, every contact, every village you visit, you have no clue what's coming next. So you can't live in that state of, I'm dirty, I'm tired, I'm hot, I'm sick. You have to live above that. And the only way you can do that is through the Spirit. One minute. Um, our devotion was on seed sowing. And coming over here from Cleveland, I, had, I called up my mother. And we were visiting with her. And she shared about our, some neighbors they had in Kentucky. I didn't know them really well, but some. Um, Bill and Irene. Irene passed away this year. Bill turned 90. And they moved away from Eastern Kentucky from that holler in 2008, 16 years ago. And uh, my mother managed to finally get a hold of Bill to share her sorrow at Irene's passing. And he was all excited and happy. And he said, you know what? I believe and I'm saved now and I got baptized. And he was somebody you couldn't talk to, to about God at all. You couldn't mention God in the conversation. Just closed. But they'd always stayed in touch and prayed for them. And um, the Korean War vet, I have no idea what all went on. There are a lot of offended people in the Bible Belt for a good reason. And um, I don't know what all, why it was, it, why it took him till 90. But he was just praising God for preservation to allow him to come to him even at 90 years old. And I just want to share that again. Same idea, the Holy Spirit, the seeds, the moments, the conversations across a fence, the visit here and there. It's what it's about. And God can bring fruit 
even if it's at 90. So, praise God. Well, good morning, everyone. Appreciate the thoughts you shared, Brother Ben. I'd like to uh, jump off of the comments he shared about being present in the context of family um, and share a few, uh, maybe a story or two and some some thoughts. Maybe first of all, uh, is there anybody here that's been married for 20 years or more? All right, you can just trade out here. Uh, tell us how many years? 20 and a half. You just so crossed that, that threshold. Okay, is there anybody here that's not married? Very good. And who's married but less than 20 years? All right. So my wife has been married. <laughs> Come on up here. Let's try it. <laughs> <laughs> so first of all, if you're not married, I hope a few of these things, I do believe some of these things I'd like to touch on briefly, uh, you can apply to your lives even if you never get married. God has a place for you in relationships, whether it's in marriage or in a close relationship, uh, are a, a lot of the same issues. Specifically, I'm thinking about marriage and family without Christian community or with limited Christian community. Uh, there's been a number of things that Rose and I have found that maybe surprised us. We didn't think about. Uh, as I mentioned, we've been married for 16 years uh, in Columbia for 10 years, and a lot of that time was either by ourselves or partially by ourselves or a small community. Um, I just want to read uh, as we think about the perfect model of what God has for us. And in our own brokenness, we're all looking for healing from God to, to be Christ-like in our relationships, in marriage in particular. Uh, I'm going to read Genesis 2, 21. And the Lord caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam, and he slept, and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh in its place. Then the rib which the Lord God had taken from man, he made into a woman. And he brought her to the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. A perfect model of a joining together and the, a joining together that illustrates our relationship with God. A no pretense, no hiding, no living in a false, this is who I am, uh, presenting to, to someone else. But in marriage, in honesty, a uh, not, not wearing a false uh, facade over us. I um, also like to mention, but we all know this, um, marriage is not a pilot project. Marriage is not a toy to experiment with and see how it works out. Um, it's not, it's, I don't know, I don't like the idea of jumping off a cliff, you're, but it's something that you started and you're going to complete. Uh, and you have a choice about how you're going to complete it. Obviously, in the process, I'm very thankful to God that we have opportunities to readjust. You know, maybe it's like a rocket. You take off and you got to drop your engines. And, and you don't have any more fuel, but you can redirect, you can readjust, you realign. We think about brokenness. We think about all of us as individuals were maybe broken people finding healing in Christ, and only in that can we share it with each other in marriage. And then in marriage, when that is good and right, then we have something to offer to the world around us. And so wherever we are working, if... I know that all of you can look outside of your home and you see many broken relationships in marriage or the lack of marriage. Um, and so 
we're all looking for how to to find that wholeness to to reach out to each other as husband and wife. So in 2019, um, Rose and I, we had moved from one part of Colombia. Uh, at that point, there was no other family, American family, other Christian American family in the community. And we moved to Leticia where there was no other uh, church community. A couple months after that, Matthew and Sarah had moved there. But right in the following six months, probably, I think it was probably our most discouraging period of, of uh, living in Colombia. Uh, exhaustion spiritually, emotionally, physically. And in those times, I think we found ourselves looking for ways of protecting ourselves from more hurt, from more harm, in ways that we didn't even realize it. And I would have to say that I think in, in some ways what woke us up to it was looking over the questionnaires and that come up at the end of the year of an annual partnership review. And in some ways, those questions made us ask other questions <laughs> that helped us think about where we are at. And obviously, it was broader than just our marriage, but I like to think about our, our marriage. Um, <clears throat> maybe... Maybe it's like, and I want you to think about if you're going to go to a place that's different than the church community that you grew up in, maybe it's sort of like living far away from urgent care or the clinic or, or the, the rescue squad. And, and so you need to think about those things before you go far away <laughs> so that you are able to be the husband or the wife to your spouse. So as we, we looked at that and we thought about ourselves and we thought about the ways that maybe we had not, um, yeah, I talked about self-protection, uh, the, uh, um, the solution to, to some of the things that we were experiencing, I think, were things like maybe adjusting expectations of what we expected of our spouse, um, things like looking for patterns in our relating to each other and our relationship that we identified as working towards not joining together and thinking and, and bearing each other up and trying to identify that before it became as big of a problem. Um, so the next thing I had down here was in relation to marriage, in kind of this thing of of uh, joining together, when you're outside of a community, you don't have as many people to relate to that share your worldview and your perspective on things. It forces you to either think together, or uh, I'm not sure what else. But I found that to be helpful actually in forcing me to learn to allow Rose's perspective to affect me and how I thought. So I like to say, let's learn to think together, but also independently, okay? So we're each thinking differently, and, and yet it's a blend of perspective as a husband and wife, right? Um, there's sort of this thing, I'm not sure the best words to describe it, but maybe we could call it like an exponential possibility of concept building when we learn to think together and yet independently, and so we come together and we hear each other, and then we come up with a new idea, or God brings that into the picture because we were willing to deny ourselves and listen to each other and build out a new concept. And so I think that's how God wants us to work. Um, and then just the thought of looking out for each other as a husband and wife by being who I need to be. A uh, very simple concept, and yet when you when you're when you're uh, in those situations of maybe limited community, you have less other people to remind you of where you're at. And so we need to be aware of those things. Um, just uh, one other quick comment. Um, so we're just at the stage now of of 
of our, our family where our children are starting to, uh, I'm not sure, they're starting to become adults or starting to think more like adults or, or working in that direction. And, um, and I'm tr we're trying to learn. And, and so this is the thing that, you know, we have a number of problems we're trying to deal with and we'll save the solutions for after we find them, right? And we can come back and talk in 15 years. But the, the idea of learning to let your children see you in your own thought process when it's appropriate and allowing them to see God work in your life and allowing them to see how God is working in the situations that you're dealing with as it is appropriate. And also something that we're trying to do is um, bringing our children into our thought processes and prayer life in the decisions that we're making as it is appropriate. And I think that has been healthy so far, but we'll see how it works out. So God bless y'all. Good morning to all of you. I'm grateful for this opportunity uh, to speak, uh, to hopefully learn together as the thing, the title was. Um, we're basically in a group of idealists, right? I mean, we just, we've got lots of visions, lots of goals, and uh, I find myself at home there. I, <clears throat> I'm glad, glad to be here. So um, this is, I'm going to share a bit of our testimony, a bit of things that we've walked through, um, like has been shared this morning already. It's not as much, this is what Preston and Carolyn did as much as what, how God has helped us through some, through some things. My wife and I have been married 14 and a half years. Um, most of that time was in a missionary context. Uh, we left for the mission field uh, five months after we were married, exactly 14 years ago. And God has uh, walked us through a lot of things. Um, I pray that in 20 years, we're having this meeting, we'll have a lot of people here that have, you know, 25 years on the mission field. Um, at this point, I try to like to um, discourage the idea of you thinking that I'm from a different generation, even though um, we have had a few years on the mission field. So <clears throat> one of the first things um, especially in an Anabaptist context, maybe otherwise. You talk about going to the mission field early in your married life. We had a lot of warnings. Oh, you should stay home for some time. Um, a lot of warnings, and I think they were good. They, they made us say, okay, is this what God wants us to do right away after we're married? We, we went in, uh, some of you know what Sent to is, is a little bit, it's a mission training school. Um, we had both been in Ghana before that, so our parents felt good, our church authorities uh, blessed us in doing that. But it made us focus a lot on our marriage. Um, Brother Darrell already spoke about this, but this is kind of a focal point that brings a lot of missionaries home from the mission field. I, I'm sorry to say that, but it is a reality. Um, not necessarily that people have, you know, totally wrecked marriages and they come home, but you hear, especially if you know what you're listening to, as people come back from the mission field, you hear a lot of fatigue, in particular among the wives. And I think there's a reason for that. Um, it's not because the wives are less spiritual. It's often because they are at a different, they're not able to, uh, they're not following what's going on as they're not in the middle of the involvement. Um, so one of the things that we were mentored in is that we need to have a lot of communication. Well, that sounds normal. Everyone likes to say that. But I endeavored, endeavor to communicate a lot with Carolyn as to what the ministry opportunities that I get. She doesn't get 
near as many ministry opportunities outside of the home. We have six children. We have, there's, there's needs. There's, she gets to visit with women sometimes. Um, possibly, I guess she used to get more opportunities, but homeschooling, that's something we, we value and kind of need to do in, you know, there isn't a, a school that the Whitmers want to send their children to right down the street. Likely, I, I'm not, I don't know exactly their context, but that's a reality. Um, and so it becomes extremely important to involve your wife in everything that you do, um, especially in hardship. Talk to your wife, cry, pray, um, walk through those things becomes very critically important. Um, every time that you're you're tempted, and this is to women or men, to withdraw, which many times we are, especially in hard things, we're, we're tempted to withdraw and close up. That's the, the wrong response. We need to walk together. Um, and we had, sometimes it feels like more of our share of, of difficulties to do that. Um, we arrived in Ghana, and I think it was, was it 10 days after we got there, we had a miscarriage that, um, you know, it's not like we had waited for 10 years for a child, but it was dear to our heart. It was, we were in the midst of one of the most volatile times. You know, you just get to the mission field, you're learning to live together. You're starting to learn to live together in a totally different cultural context. Um, very difficult, very painful. Um, we also, um, in studying French, we went to Burkina Faso in 2014. And we, we look back at that time and God really pushed at us from every angle. Um, it, it felt cruel. It felt like we could not understand near everything that God was doing there. Um, we arrived there. We had, uh, two very small girls and my wife was expecting a baby. We rented a house. We didn't, we didn't have as near as much, um, we didn't have anybody that was helping us walk through these things like we should have. Um, probably one of the hardest things was that our church started, excuse me to use this term, fighting um, internally. Fortunately, it wasn't about us, but um, it, it, it was an excruciating year. Um, kind of finishing... We we stopped, we left Burkina Faso studying French. Uh, we left there. My wife's health was, um, had deteriorated. She had a lot of um, hormonal uh, challenges. And so <clears throat> we're not still missionaries today. I, I hope none of you think, you know, missionaries, if you don't hit any, too big of an obstacle, you can keep on being there. We're not missionaries today because we've never been discouraged or in a very low point. Um, we're missionaries because of because of of God and His calling on our lives. Because you know we've we've had fortunately we've had many. Um, people that have encouraged us along the way. Um, but crucial to that is communication. Um, your wife, your growing children, I'm kind of in the same stage there as Daryl is, um, learning to involve them in the victories and the discouragements. You know, what do you do 
Um, this was uh, six weeks, a month ago, six weeks ago. Um, one of our closest Nigerian friends told me, and he tried to be nice about it, but it, it really w was a little bit like a spear. He told me, Preston, you're, if you weren't so stingy and were more generous and, you know, would, would love people, you'd actually see a lot more results in your ministry. Um, and, you know, that's not the first time I've heard things like that, but it was probably maybe the hardest barb from the closest person. I mean, that's, that's kind of a, a tough thing to hear. And actually, within days of that, I heard from an authority in the States that it was said about, Preston, I think you're too generous. And you, it, it was in particular relating with the SALT program and certain things that maybe you don't really believe in the SALT program. And those kind of things are tough to hear. Um, there's a little bit of comfort in the fact that at least I must be somewhere in the middle then, but <laughs> what do I do? I take those things and I talk about them with my wife and we laugh and we cry together sometimes about those kind of things because, um, not everything's easy. There's a lot of, uh, challenging, difficult things to work through, but it's always better. I think it's always better to share with my wife and, and some with my children. Um, I will say just this last scenario, actually both of them came back and basically said, okay, we didn't quite understand the whole picture there. And they they kind of backed off of what they said. Um, so anyway, I think that's about all that I had to say. So God bless you. Thank you, Preston. Wasn't Carolyn going to share something too? We still have a little more time. Why don't you come on back up here, both of you together, and uh, I'd like to hear from Carolyn as well. We had a prayer time up here this morning, and Preston asked, would it be okay if my wife shared too? And we said, of course. Now you all know that I chickened out. <laughs> um, so talking about marriage and all, how that involves on the mission field. Um, one thing that I'll just say who it was, Christy Keniston told me um, right after our miscarriage there, um, we were six months married and getting ready to go to the village for the first time and thinking about, you know, just me and my husband in this village. I can't really speak to anybody. And the only person I can talk to is my husband and um, dealing with a lot of mixed up hormones and all that goes with all that. Um, she just told me that different times she has really been struggling and not knowing how to feel and she has learned to go to her husband and say, how am I supposed to be feeling at this time? And before going, she would purpose in her heart to obey. And so I took that and it really worked. It's one of those things that when we as women, we get mixed up and we don't, we just can't see straight at times. And God has put us in that beautiful place of being able to um, be under our husband. And sometimes we women forget that that is a beautiful place and we kind of twist and say, you don't understand how I'm feeling. But if we can find that grace to put ourselves under and just choose to make ourselves feel or choose to act on um, maybe feelings we don't have, then God does give a lot of grace. And um, so that's just my encouragement to you as um, 
There's a lot of ladies here that haven't walked this road, and we are passionate that you learn to thrive on the mission field, and we are super happy to be here and just give you that go for it, you know? And um, there's, there are a lot of um, struggles that come with being a missionary wife. Um, Rolanda shared very well with how situations can be, and it's not easy. I've told Preston just real recently in this past few months, I said, I feel like I'm jealous of you because you're the one with all the social, and I'm here in the house. We just had a baby this year, so it's been a lot more in the house for me this year, and um, that's been hard for me. I like getting out. I like talking to people. I like interacting. And for us, that's why it is so needful that Preston shares his life with me so I can feel like I'm involved in his victories. Um, and it's not all easy for him as well, obviously, but that the, the struggle of loneliness is probably one of the biggest ones. And um, I just want to encourage each one here to um, embrace your life and do what you can to be involved with others and then relax because it's okay if you're not with able to be with your host culture all the time. It's okay. And um, I feel like WhatsApp is a wonderful invention. Um, I, I say that carefully because I know that we can become too involved in our WhatsApp fellowship, but um, it has been a real, real blessing for me to be able to fellowship with other ladies that I can't physically be with. And um, yeah, if you can find a group that is in your shoes or, or that you can relate with well and... Um, that's been a wonderful um, avenue for me to just be able to get the fellowship that I need. So I think that's all I've been, all I had on my heart. Thank you. And thank you to each of you who shared. So Brother Harold asked if I would moderate the question and answer time. And we have 35 minutes. If we don't use up the whole time, that's fine. But we do want to take sufficient time to share, have some further discussion. Thank you to each of you individuals, couples that shared. So I'm just going to do a brief recap, and then we're going to open it for, for questions here from anyone. Jeff, will you pass a mic around, or you just want people to stand and speak up? All right, so we'll do the latter. So we had uh, Ben speaking to us first about being present where we are. God's work is in the present, and he referenced several passages from the book of Luke and called us to depend on the Holy Spirit to teach us in the moment how to live rather than having a checklist of do's and don'ts that we're operating by. So thank you, Ben, for that challenge. And just a bit, we'll open it up for uh, questions for Ben or for anyone else. Daryl, thank you for calling us from your own journey to walk with and live with our wives according to knowledge. I think you shared there from uh, your heart and calling us to just be open with each other. And uh, you said something like this, we need to hear each other so that together we can have an exponentially better idea. I like that. Um, two are better than one. And if it's always my idea, and my wife's isn't uh, part of the script, so to speak, then uh, probably we'll only have ideas that are half or less as good. So thank you, Daryl. Caleb and Rolanda, uh, the call to be flexible. Uh, Caleb and I spent some time at SIL together learning some of those second language acquisition uh, methodologies. And I'll be honest, Caleb, I was a little disappointed when I heard you didn't get to use them in your context. But Thank you for your example, both of you, for being flexible and just taking what the day brings. And, and um, yeah, as Bryant has often said, if someone gives you lemons, then make lemonade. So you've been a good example for, in that. Appreciate your flexibility and your testimony. 
And then we just heard from Preston. I don't know that I need to recap a whole lot more there. Thank you, Preston, for sharing about your marriage and some of the things you've walked through, and Carolyn as well. Really appreciate that. So I'm going to open it up for questions. There's uh, the, the quote that Harold had, the, had, had at the beginning of his, his email he sent yesterday to these four gentlemen said this. He said, get experienced advice as cheap as you can. Others have paid a high price for it. So that's one of my favorite quotes. I've never actually seen it on paper. Bill Gothard is the first one I heard use that quote. And so I was curious to see that you actually found the name and attached it to it, Harold. I want to ask you afterwards where you found that. But anyways, we have some experienced advice in here. Some uh, men who've been on the field for, I heard Ben say last night, he first uh, started working with the Mayunga in, in 99 and 2000. So that's, that's pushing 25 years. It's wonderful. And there's other brothers here too. So what questions do you have for the brothers who shared? Who will be first? You can either just uh, stand where you are or just speak up loud from your seat. And let's go ahead and ask uh, if you have some questions you'd like to hear them comment on further. The time is yours. Who will be first? Well, I have a question then for Carolyn. Carolyn, thank you for being brave enough to come up here and talk. So I'm going to throw out a question to get us started. So I believe in the principle you shared. I think it's really true. I've seen it work. In other words, if, if your husband has asked you to do something, I heard you saying, learn the principle of submission and obedience. What if you know he's wrong? Okay. <laughs> wow, Preston. <laughs> okay. <laughs> what if you think he's wrong? You're pretty sure you know he's wrong. If we're in, if we're in a um, kind of like in public and he's saying to do something that I don't think is the best, I just, well, even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, you, you have to obey, you have to submit, and then later you can discuss it. Mm -hmm. It's how we've operated. Mm -hmm. Okay, excellent. Thank you. So I hear you calling us, and I'm going to put the men in this too, all of us are under authority. I hear you calling us to a principle that I believe God honors, and that is even if we're pretty sure we have the better idea, when we learn to submit, God honors that. It's beautiful. Thank you. Any else, anyone else have a comment on that or an additional question along that, that line of, of thought or anything else? Yeah, I'd just like to say that um, it really puts us men in a very, very trusted role. And I, it's not like Carolyn has never appealed different decisions or things that we've talked about. And it makes me a lot more cautious, a lot more sensitive to what she said. And I, as it should, mm -hmm. I think all of us should be doubly careful when our wives are, you, you know that they don't think you're doing quite the right thing, then it often makes you think about that decision twice as much as it should. Wow. Could I just add to that, Preston? Thank you. That if you sense from someone who is in submission to your authority that heart, that's exactly the effect that it should have. In other words, if you sense resistance and like, I'm not sure that I, it's like, okay, then maybe I need to dig my heels in further too. But when you sense the opposite of that, I've seen this work in my own life uh, where God will just really use that to work in authority's heart and actually change the situation. So that's powerful. That are on the field. Um, how do you prioritize like, time with just you two. I know at least we only have two children, but a lot of you have many more than that. How do you prioritize your marriage in just couple time amidst all the many missionary responsibilities as well as your children? All right, you heard the question. 
So who wants to go first from the couples that spoke in answering that? It's a great question, Chandra. Okay, Daryl. So we're all learning together. Um, and I think for Rose and I, it has been different things in different seasons of life. And so the most recent one has been um, just assigning a certain time of the day. For us, it was 9 o'clock p.m. We would always come together as much as we could at a certain place and have maybe even a limited time of debriefing. And um, maybe it was reading the Bible together or, or talking about the issues that came up that day. Um, but prioritizing it, and, and I still think there's, um, every aspect of life needs to take priority at a different time. And so, you know, time with children I think is important, but they're not the center. And yet, at the same time, we need to take time for each of those things. Um, at different time in life, it's, it's a different time for us. Thank you, Gerald. Yeah. Something that I was trying to say and it left me. Um, but the, um, sorry, but the, let me see if it comes back later. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. Preston's going to help us out. It's all those uh, responsibilities that stacked over you the last, that's the way our brains work sometimes. But um, I think it's all in the word priority. Um, it's challenging. You don't, you don't just naturally have time. Um, for us, we often debrief late at night, and we don't get up at 5 o'clock in the morning. I'm sorry. I don't function very good on... A small amount of sleep so we often spend you know 30 minutes an hour talking at night and then sometimes our you know when we get up is a little later <clears throat> it's I mean in our context Nigerians go to bed uh, midnight generally and so we're kind of on the early side there but according to them but we don't uh, put the children in bed at 7.30. So you have to be adaptable and remember your priorities. Good. So just building on the question a little bit, in our context here in the States, most of us, if we want a date night or you know, have a chance to go out just together as a couple, we have either grandparents or else a large enough community that we can ask a friend or grandpa and grandma to take care of the children. How does that work for those of you who don't have that in your context? Caleb says, put the kids to bed. All right. Is there any other options? Five minutes and then five minutes later um, do it and then along with that this isn't what came to my mind earlier but I think it's more important is love your wife or your husband for the sake of your family and and take time for your children but let your children know that you have a priority to love your wife as a husband uh, for me Levi, do you and Angie ever have a date night in Indonesia? Occasionally, uh, Matthews will help us out with that, but um, mm -hmm. not very often. And we learn to function as a family. So it's just kind of how it is. Uh, we don't drop the children off at grandma's house very often. And so we, we learn to embrace living as a family. Uh, if we're going to go do something special, go to a waterfall, have a picnic, 
we'll do that as a family. So that's kind of how we cope with that one. Mm -hmm. Good. Preston has a comment as well. Yeah, I think it's putting children to bed work very well as long as the children are under 10. Um, that changes a little bit the older you get because missionaries all f also come home from the field because their young people are just totally finished. And I mean, this is something I'm, I'm praying about. I want to learn well. Um, we're just getting ready to enter the teenage years for our children. I need to keep them involved. So um, not to say that there's nothing special you can do. I, my parents had a good marriage, um, lived in a very, I'd say, normal setting all their lives, but they did almost no date nights ever. Um, I haven't really followed that e example perfectly, but I think it is important for us to realize that date nights don't make good marriages. They, they can put a little bit of icing on top of the cake maybe and kind of, but that's really, um, they don't make good marriages. We've been in missionary settings where, you know, couples are able to laugh about the night they rented at a hotel and the air conditioning didn't work and the sheets weren't washed. And well, if you really count on special events, you're going to be disappointed. I'm sorry. But if you're able to laugh about them, I'm not saying you can't try sometimes, but there's not going to be, you know, the exotic restaurant down the street that you can take your family to in our corner of the world. I, I'm not sure there are, uh, there's probably places that All Nations is working where you may have more available, but that's just from our experience. Up here's a question. Thank you for that. So, as someone who's courting, what are questions? Looking because we're both looking at going to the field, if and when we get married. What are questions we should be asking and things we should be figuring out now? that would help us later if we get married, when we get married. Okay. Well, I like to keep things simple. Um, looking for commitment. It's not, compatibility has a place, but commitment at the end is what makes or breaks it. Carolyn has a comment. Um, we as girls sometimes think, you know, I'll just follow my husband wherever he leads me and I'll be fine. Um, in a missionary context, that's really not going to cut it. I feel like you have to personally both have a call from God to the mission field. Um, there have been times, quite a few times in our lives that I've been super thankful that it wasn't Preston who dragged me to the mission field. It was God who called me, and I did not have a choice being under God, you know, my vows to God. I. This was my life, whether Preston was involved or not. And that saves a lot of um, being bitter at your husband. And so <clears throat> thinking about young people in courtship, you have to be sure that both of you are called. That's good, Carolyn. So. I have a question on that, and it could be that you or anyone else here that's on the field could answer that. Um, sometimes, so I'm going to put myself in the, the shoes of a wife 
How do you know if you're called? So isn't the fact that I'm married to my husband or planning to marry this man and he has a calling, um, I guess you're speaking about in the context of before you're married, but um, what does that call actually sound or look like? Um, anyone's welcome to speak to that, but Carol, maybe since you had such a sense that the Lord was calling you to be a missionary, would you mind speaking to how that resonated in your heart? It's not too personal. I don't know. Um, it's hard to relate how you know what God wants you to do. Um, in my later teenage years, I guess I just really sensed that God was calling me somewhere. And um, then going on Sent One, that call was reaffirmed. And I knew that I was going to be... Um, I was going to be in service somewhere. There was no other option. It was, yeah, I guess that's the best way to say it. Just in my heart, God had shown me that there was no other option for me. Thank you. Who else? Any questions or comments before we wrap this time up? Joshua. I know Brother Caleb uh, talked a little bit about this, but how many face the struggle, the face uh, the stress of needing to or feeling like they need to perform more than they are to accomplish more on the field, whether that's their own self drive or others? supporters, however, feel like maybe they should be beyond where they currently are. How, how, have, how have you, if you face that, how, how have you handled it? Ben, do you ever get the sense that people are wishing you'd be further along in your project? How do you cope with that? We'll let you speak to this one. Yeah, I'd say kind of all the time. Um, um, it's pretty much the only thing I think we hear. Um, I take a deep breath <laughs> and I try to take it to the Lord again. Um, I mean, I, I think it's I think it's important. I think it's good because, on the one hand, it's easy to lose sight of the end goal when you're in the middle of the forest, and you know every every tree, every spot on the trail is is something you have to deal with. It's easy to lose sight of where you're going, but um, there is a place where where you're trying to balance human needs, people's physical condition, people's um, bandwidth, what they can handle, um, how much you can lay on somebody else. And, and that, that's, um, that's something I think we have to be really careful with in our family and in our marriage and something I'm just barely learning to do. I don't think I have any handle on it, but I'm at least aware of it, so it's a problem I can work on, is not passing that stress on. Um, take it to the Lord. Um, take it to the back pasture. Take it somewhere. But don't take it to your family. Um, some of those things, I think, as men, we have to learn to, to deal with in the right context and, and not pass on the burden. Because it's... And that's a little bit of what I was trying to share with the idea of being present because um, it's easy for me to excuse my lack of involvement with my children or the fact that my son says, you always say tomorrow and tomorrow never comes. Um, or with my wife, the same way. 
you, you know, I talk to you and you don't hear me. Well, it's easy to end up with those stresses in our mind to where every spare moment, that's what's focused. You know, what are we missing? How could we change this? How can I get that team member to somehow respond without having to tell him because I can't? Or, you know, how, what's going on in this guy's life because he's obviously not connecting, but I don't know what it is and I can't ask. Or, you know, you have all these different areas of cultural improper communication that you need to communicate. There's no way to. You need answers. You need performance. You need things to function. And you don't have a way to get there. It's only the Lord that can actually do it. And... Um, so you, you, you end up being kind of the rubber in the middle that has to take from both sides. Um, you have to deal with the reality on the ground, and yet you have to try to come up with somewhat plausible answers to those questions from supporters or your, your translation consultant or your, you know, um, your organization. organization or whatever. You need, you need a somewhat believable answer, but... At the same time, you have a reality on the ground that you can't really change sometimes. So anyway, it's, it's an interesting situation, but I think the big thing to remember in the context of our discussion is, is um, take it to the Lord. He can carry that burden, mm -hmm. and he can cause that team member to come back to himself, or he can cause that person to sense their own lack. Um, he can find a way to communicate with that person in a way you can't without causing a rift or a mm -hmm. tension or something. But when you pass the burden on, it never works. I and mean, when, when you pass that stress on to your, to your children or to your wife or to your team members, it doesn't work. Thank you, Ben. Juanita. One thing that I would encourage everyone, especially if you're on a team, is to not compare yourselves with how much you do with what your team members do, whether you feel like you do so much more and you wonder what your team members do all day or whether you feel like you're not getting as much done as they are. It's, it's between you and God anyway. It wasn't between you and other people. Um, one thing that I've had to realize is that we're all in different stages of life. We all have different abilities. Um, some people have so, more energy than others. For me, I don't have a family, and so all I do is, um, you know, work with, with the people there, learning language all day. I have nothing else. Um, and people that have a family have other responsibilities. And so that's my encouragement. Don't compare yourselves. Thank you. Okay. We can wrap up a bit early. If there's a last question, shout it out. If not, we'll wrap up early and have a little time for fellowship before children come back in. Yes, Brother Harold. Hear the question, how do we come to the place of being okay with not knowing the results for what we're doing? I don't, I don't, maybe this is the wrong answer, but what comes to my mind is you, should, you shouldn't just be going to get the results. Like You should be going because you're trying to be faithful to what God wants you to do. You should set that in your mind way before you ever go to wherever you're going. Um, I'm not saying that to diminish the struggles of wondering why you're not seeing results, but um, I mean, we probably all have different struggles. So my, my question is more that I pray to God all the time is, Lord, am I, doing, am I doing exactly what you want me to do? Is there anything else that I'm not doing that you want me to be doing? You know, like today, this week. So, but yeah, I don't think that's something we need to be burdened over. <laughs>